Welcome to the Care to Listen podcast, where we interview frontline workers and healthcare experts who will share their stories and passions. This is a podcast to let you know that you're not alone. The goal of this series is to reduce the mental health stigma in healthcare and provide accessible support for caregivers just like yourself. Today's episode is being broadcasted to you on the unceded and traditional territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the first episode of the Care to Listen podcast. Uh, I'm your host, Sean Burke, the founder and CEO of Checking In. So joining me today is Pierre Florendo, the Director of Care at the Kiwanis Care Centre. We're so excited to have you to talk a little bit about some of you know, the challenges like going through the pandemic, um, you know, the mental health issues and concerns that have come up. So thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. So Pierre, thanks for joining us. Um, I'd just like to, you know, obviously you're somebody who has been an integral um, contributor towards helping people get through and navigate this pandemic. Um, and being the director of care at a long-term uh, care home, there's obviously so much we can cover and talk about today. Uh, before we do, I'd just love for you to do an introduction and let people know who you are. My name is Pierre Florendo. I am the director of care at Kiwanis Care Centre. It is a 75-bed care home in New Westminster. I've been there for about three years and two weeks to be exact. Um, so I started just before the pandemic. And it was interesting to see the change from what we considered normal back then to what normal is now. And it's been a really interesting transition. And so I'd, uh, there's a lot of stories you can share about that. Awesome. We appreciate it. And, you know, obviously having some, some pre-conversations, father of three, um, also having a, a wife who works in uh, acute, more acute care, but again, near and dear to your heart, serving others uh, and being a, you know, big big support when it came through getting through the pandemic. Walk me through when you were first starting, when you, COVID was introduced, um, you know, what was your first experience and, and how did that show up for you? So when we were hearing rumblings of something is happening, uh, keep in mind that I had just started at this care home, so I was still getting accustomed to how, the, how do things work here, who are the residents, who are the staff. So there was that transition I had to deal with, but there was also messages coming from the news, from the health authority, from uh, other care homes saying, okay, what's happening here? What's going on? And so when we started seeing the news uh, from other care homes that there were cases getting in, and the first case that happened in British Columbia, there was apprehension, there was confusion as to what to do next, and trying to figure out what the best thing to do was not only for the care home, but also personal, personal considerations, because as you, can, as you mentioned, one of my kids uh, is three years old, so that means she was born just about six months before the pandemic started. So seeing that, thinking about, uh, and if that's my experience, we've got all the other staff in the home thinking about their personal lives, their work lives, everything. So that was a very interesting um, first couple months, just trying to navigate through, okay, what do we do now? So walk me through, what was the psyche like for you know, workers who were in the care homes, um, knowing that care homes and long-term care homes were a source of the initial sort of epicenters of some of the transmissions? What was, what was that like? How was the mental um, challenges that you guys faced like? Well, there were varying responses. Um, we had, we're, not, we're not strangers to respiratory outbreaks. Like we had influenza outbreaks in long-term care. It's not something new but this felt somewhat different because we we were hearing the news we were hearing that this seems to be different and uh, what does it mean for for residents um, for staff I mean uh, long-term care we do have those challenges already for working with a vulnerable population there was a lack of clarity as to what happens next? I, I think that was the, that's always going to be the big question is like, what do we do now and what happens next? And, and, you know, having that sort of lack of clarity, what was the, the outcome from a mental health perspective? Like how have, did your colleagues respond and what were some of the impacts there? Well, when you're living a life of uncertainty or, or that feeling of, I don't know what to do next, you're, you're always looking at it, 
like crisis mode that doesn't resolve itself. So you're you have you feel like you're on edge, but you don't know what to feel on edge for. As as the pandemic progressed, as we got more information, there was still that feeling of I don't know what to do yet. We're not sure what to do at this point. We know we have to carry on, but we don't know what else is going to happen. Yeah, and I I mean I can totally, you know, visualize at the beginning of the pandemic you had. You know, the general community coming out, I think it was seven Mm o'clock, banging pots and pans, being there, supportive. What and how did that change and transformation as the pandemic, you know, continued on? How did that sort of impact the long-term care workers? So when we first experienced the 7 p.m. celebration or banging of pots and pans, rather, the way where Kiwanis Care Center is, there is, there are at least three towers of... Uh, independent living or supportive housing and it was amazing to be surrounded by that by that sound for the first month (laughs) and then as it progressed you could hear it getting fainter but at the same time our our response was or the reception that we had was okay that's great that you're doing that is there anything else that you can do because but at that point too like yeah you you're appreciating us but at the same time there's nothing else really happening residents weren't allowed to leave the building. And then we were dealing with that. Then they were allowed to receive one visitor. Then they weren't allowed to receive a visitor. Then they were allowed to receive um, a couple of visitors. Like as times changed, we had to adapt, but we never had that ability to take a moment and say, okay, what's happened here? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think a lot of the work that we do around building that self-awareness taking that pause and and allowing yourself to sort of process those emotions and let them pass. I mean, it sounds like so much of the experience is that it's just constantly go, 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 and there hasn't been that opportunity. How does that impact the general psyche, the team morale when it comes to working in long-term care? So those who have worked in long-term care may understand the term single site. There was an order from the Ministry of Health to have staff work in one care home only. And before that, there were staff working in multiple homes. They could work casual or they could work lines in multiple places. So what happened there is one single site was implemented, I believe, in March of 2020. That really cut down our team already. So for in my perspective or what I had to deal with personally, I went from 21 nurses to nine. And that's a huge wow. cut. You already saw that team shrink and the workload didn't shrink. But the way we worked in long-term care was carry on. But you would see that as the days went, you could see eventual burnouts because there were no reinforcements coming. Mm -hmm. Because uh, we couldn't hire casuals fast enough because there weren't any. Everybody was fighting for the same amount of people working or were also competing with other aspects of healthcare, like acute care, home care. At times you do have that despair that no one is coming. You have that feeling of that obligation that someone has to be here, but you're also fighting with that obligation of, okay, where am I supposed to be? Because I've got work, yes, I've got vulnerable people who need us, but I've also got my connection, my family, my health. You know, some of the horror stories when it came to not having that support, not having a full team, um, and really getting into healthcare to support the patient. And, you know, some of the risks and, and challenges that come with being short staff and some of the sacrifices that, that you had to make. So maybe, you know, I'd love to hear just that, that story around the office and the office turning into oh, a bedroom yeah. and, and everything else. Well, like I mentioned, I had nine nurses shrinking down to five nurses <laughs> shrinking down to if anyone calls in sick, there is no registered nurse coming and I have a nurse license, so therefore I have to work. Uh, there was one time I recall where I was called in at 9 p.m., had to work 11 a.m. And then the morning <laughs> nurse called in sick too. So it was working an unexpected 16 hour shift night today and not sleeping the night before. So I did tell my coworkers, look, I have to have some sort of a break. And the only place I could have was my office um, using a sleeping bag and some sort of cushioning to, to try and get some rest because 
we recognize that it's almost like working impaired if you don't get enough sleep, and it's really dangerous when you've you've got your nurse who needs that break but hasn't had that break. And I, I will say that I wish that, that that was a unique story in long-term care, but we know that that was happening in many care homes. So I can, I'm sure some of the listeners can can think of stories where they were short-staffed, and so that that is one personal story of what was happening. It's it's the mindset and the psyche of you know you're there for your patients, you're serving mm -hmm. your patients, but at the same time you touched on having a family and the need to balance and you know also the fears especially at the beginning of the unknown of potentially bringing home covid um what was that like and that's tough i mean my kids are asking okay why do you why do you have to go to work and sometimes i do question that myself like when i i know why i have to go to work but when they ask me and they said you're you're you seem you're always there and they're right and we have to, we had, uh, I had the conversation with my wife trying to work out, okay, what are we going to do here? Because as mentioned, like, look how young they are. They're eight, six, and three. And they're, um, the older ones are going through a transition where they went from school to absolutely no school or school online. Yeah. The youngest has really never known a life without, without COVID. And so we're trying to provide our support, but also balancing we have, we have, as mentioned, we have obligations in, in all these different places and trying to power through and figure or figure out where, where, where I should be or where um, healthcare workers need to be, it, it was tough. It was a tough balancing, balancing act. And I'm sure years from now, we're still going to have that conversation as to what did I make, did we make the right decisions as to where we were supposed to be? What does the industry and profession need in order to help process and work through those emotions from your perspective? I think the first thing is, that we need to do is have a change of value where we, where we value a, the apparent strength of having the ability to keep going and instead recognize that we're human, we do need time to process, time to take that break, time to talk about it, time to get support. Because I know when you're in healthcare, healthcare workers are sometimes the worst people to take care of their own health, hmm. right? So because we, we know too much and we, the way we feel is, okay, we, we know enough to, to know where our boundary is and how much we can push, right? And so we, get, we can get overconfident and feel that, okay, no, I can do just one more, just one more. Until, we, until your body says, no, you can't. Mm -hmm. And so having, encouraging people to take their sick days, if, if they're not feeling great to go, you know what, today we'll take care of this, then when it's our turn or my turn to be sick, then you can help cover for me, right? Where we can all support each other. Allow that vulnerability, like have, that, have those discussions. Have, even if you have 15 minutes to talk about how are you doing, rather than just going straight to how's work. Right, like what what things do we need, or what tasks do we need to get done today? Having that period to just say, "How are you doing?" and "How are you feeling?" and "Is there something that we can support you with?" Uh, as leaders, we have to not only allow but encourage having that having that conversation. Like where I can I can feel free to tell my staff, "Look, I'm I'm having trouble too," because uh, and. I would I would love more leaders to say that this is how it's going. How I feel personally. This is what I feel like right now, and so that opens the door to have to have uh, others, other healthcare workers, talk about that. And uh, as you get to know each other, as you get to see each other's needs, uh, that's where you can all, or we can all acknowledge. Okay, this is what we need right now. This is what you need individually. Um, recognizing that it's more than you are more than just who you are at work. When leaders see their workers as more than just workers, but as people, and recognize the entire, or at least acknowledge the entire list of things that they have to go through. Or and conversely, when workers also see that leaders are human too, and you all have that feeling that we're here, we're all here together. We're we are this community then I can see um, that's where the support will come from. And you can always, you can also extend that to beyond a single care home. You have 
uh, long-term care as a sector, healthcare as a sector, and then that builds up to the general population. Today's episode is brought to you by the Care for Caregivers program. Care for Caregivers is an online resource established to provide mental health supports for the dedicated healthcare workers. This initiative represents a partnership between the Canadian Mental Health Association BC Division and Safe Care BC and is proudly supported by the BC Ministry of Mental Health and Addictions. One part of the Care for Caregivers program is the Care to Speak line. Care to Speak is a peer-based phone, text, and web chat service that provides free and confidential support to health and social support workers in BC. Connect with us from Monday to Friday from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. Pacific time. Text or call 1-866-802-7337. As I'm hearing you sort of talk through some of the opportunities for us to reduce that stigma, to have those open conversations, so much of it is a result of an individual seeking community, seeking support from colleagues, mentors, managers. Mm -hmm. What other supports are needed um, within the industry and profession to support the mental health of you know, your industry? It's a two-way street. It has to, if the individual is seeking community, there has to be a community there. So if the industry changes their focus from this mentality of the assembly line that, okay, here's a bunch, we're hiring you, here's a bunch of things that you have to get done, here's all the stuff you have to get done, and shift away from that and move towards this is a community. This is, this is a care home. This is the home part. So we're a home. Yes, we have to get things done, but primarily we live here. Some of us live here 24-7, the residents. Some of us live here for eight hours, but it's not just work. It's having changing that value to this is where people live. This is where we live. If there's a change in the structure and the purpose of a long-term care home, um, moving away from feeling like it's a place where people need care to this is a privilege for us to, to be in this home and so now that we recognize that it is a home, how are we going to think about it differently? Mm-hmm. Like, how do we, like, what do you think of when you think of home? Right. And then how do we bring that to our, our current, um, our current setup for long-term care? How does, you know, the industry move towards that model? I'm really focusing on the leaders here because they have the ability when they model, uh, behavior and the values to step away from okay we need to get x number of baths done we need to feed this number of people we need to do this and instead say how can we best help you and when leaders say that they're not talking about residents they're talking about staff and so when leaders move to the model of how can i best help you so that regarding staff so that staff can best help residents live uh, lives to the highest quality and so that's where I say it is that local level uh, for leadership and once they when they empower their staff staff can then uh, help residents not only live another day but flourish and so I, I'm not necessarily saying that uh, it needs to come from the province, the health authorities, although it would help to get support. You can have a care home and you can have the care regulations, but two different care homes can carry that out in different ways, right? Depending on how that culture is built, how it's sustained and how it's transformed. Just based on your experience, what's preventing or stopping different care homes from doing that? I feel that some care homes carry on with their tradition of this is how it's always been done. And not that there's anything wrong with that per se. Uh, people like stability. They like tradition. They, this, is, this is what has worked. Basically, um, change can be difficult. Sometimes the way the organization is set up, it is, it's, can't be as agile as others. Stigma is difficult to, to we acknowledge that. It, it's, by its very nature, it can be difficult to, to reach out. You, there is that shame that's involved. There is that... That feeling that okay, the community does not does not value feeling like this or or being like this, so you do have that natural tendency to to want to step away or don't talk about it, 
And so for the individual, I just say don't go it alone, that um, you do need to find those, to find and maintain and strengthen those connections that you do have, um, or that you have rather, and having that community that, can, that accepts you, but, and not only accepts you, but will help you. Um, and sometimes the thing is you don't even know what help you need at the moment because you can't mm -hmm. see through what you're dealing with. So that's where, again, you have those, you have the community that can, that can tell you honestly, we see that you're struggling here. We won't force the help that we think you need, but we have that relationship. We, we care about you and we're here for you anytime. Continuously looking, having that self-awareness to go, how am I doing today? Also having that organizational awareness of how are we doing? We kind of just want to hero through it because that's kind of the message we were getting with the seven o'clock banging was, hey, it's healthcare heroes, but heroes are human too. Mm -hmm. we, need to, we need to take a look, an honest look at ourselves to say that we don't need to be strong all the time, that we need our downtime, and then recognizing in the other as well that you too need to also have that downtime. So how can we support each other and so for those that, that are struggling or don't have those relationships yet, um, I would encourage those the people to find, your, to find your network or to build up your network because uh, you can't keep going in alone. You'll find your group that's, that will help you as you help them as well. Heroes are human too. That's such a powerful statement. And I think you know from everything we covered today, um, that's somewhere that I would love to leave the listeners um, as we sign off here. And, uh, I just wanted to say thank you very much for coming in, sharing your experiences, sharing some of your thoughts and you know, helping be part of the conversation because the more people that talk about this, the more that we're gonna be able to build and foster those communities of support and provide those safe places for people to show up as authentically their true selves. So thank you, Pierre, for coming in today and uh, we wish you all the best. Thank you for having me. Thank you for listening to this entire podcast episode. We hope you enjoyed the show and be sure to visit the links in the show notes for more resources and support from the Care for Caregivers program. If you're interested in sharing your story on the Care to Listen podcast, please reach out to us at careforcaregivers.ca forward slash podcast. Don't forget to follow us on your favorite podcast platform to be notified when new episodes are released. Thanks again for joining us and see you next month.